Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. This is a question that comes from Dave, um, and he doesn't give his call sign. Um, it's a comment that was on a post uh, getting the 80 meter loop back in shape. Uh, which is a long, old post for me. But he said, but it also works on all bands with a tuner. Okay, that was a quote he took from my uh, post. It says, Dave, I've been reading about tuners, and they have been telling me, they have been telling me, that tuners do not tune antennas, only the feed line between the antenna and the radio. Is that what you are saying here, too? No, <laughs> not at all. First of all, what's tuning? Um, tuning is bringing something to resonance or bringing the resonant point to the point where we want it to be. For example, if you're going to tune a piano, you want the A above middle C to be exactly 440 hertz. A440 is the standard for Western music and has been for quite a number of years, although there are still a few people wandering around who like the A432 standard rather than the A440. But be that as it may, tuning is adjusting something so that it resonates at the right frequency. Now, a lot of radio, and I'm going to draw something here, a lot of radio has circuits that look like uh, this. They've got the antenna coming in, and there's a coil, and it's, it's sort of in the form of a transformer, and there's usually a, a capacitor that's tunable. And this goes into the uh, grid of the uh, next stage and so on, and then this comes into something that's tunable, uh, usually it's an air, air kind of thing, and there's another capacitor here, and these are all ganged together. And uh, you're tuning each one, tuning them for resonance, for resonance. This is how superheterodynes work. They're tuned for resonance. Now, the great champion of resonance was Nikola Tesla. He was very into resonance. Everything has a resonant point. It's a point where it vibrates. I was trying to get a tuning fork for this story, but they're real hard to find. Um, I'd love to have a tuning fork, but I don't think they make them anymore because they make the little electronic gadgets. But um, to show that uh, when you, uh, that everything you touch you hear the tone there in my water bottle. There is uh, a resonant frequency. Even bridges have uh, uh, resonant frequencies, which is why when a military procession marches across the bridge, they break step. They don't march in step across the bridge. They just sort of shuffle along at, at their own individual rate because the constant whomp, 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 might hit a resonant frequency of the bridge and cause it to uh, start to destroy itself. Mythbusters did uh, an episode on this where they f found an old bridge that had been bypassed, was not being used anymore. It wasn't terribly long, three or 400 feet across the river. And they actually f found a small device that would create a sine wave that found the resonant frequency of the bridge. And they actually scared themselves. They got off of the bridge because it was vibrating so bad, just from this little tiny source. Well, anyway, this is the whole point of resonance, that the thing will vibrate at a particular frequency and with all the capacitors and inductors and stuff, uh, you're able to adjust that frequency to the frequency that you want. And everything else is rejected. And that's kind of how uh, superheterodynes work. Now, um, with new modern digital radios, that's not how it's done. It's done differently. What you do is you create... Um, a pulse, okay, 
um, and this is time going forward. You create a pulse every so often. Now, you do this with counters. There's one crystal in the system. Every radio has at least one crystal because what they're doing is it's 25 megahertz in the little uh, uh, QRP Labs uh, uh, radios. Um, you count that down and you use a series of add additions and things like that. So you get a pulse every hertz. Now this right here has some really weird harmonics, but one thing that it does have, and this is very important to understand, is it has a fundamental frequency. And so if you put this through a filter, boy, I make lousy arrows, don't I? Put this through a filter, what you're going to get out is a sine wave at the fundamental. Because what a square wave is, is a sum of gazillions of sine waves that are harmonically related. Uh, in some cases you can play with overtones, but mostly it's harmonics. Harmonics are multiples of the frequency. The second harmonic is the multiple by two and so on. Uh, overtones you find in music because uh, on a string instead of just you know a sine wave or a straight across like that you can actually get three halves and so multiples of the half frequency are overtones the ones that, that fit in between the harmonics but this is a really weird thing to think about okay the fundamental frequency in a recurring square wave is a sine wave. Think about that for a minute. Okay. If this is 7 megahertz, that this is happening here, you're going to get 7 megahertz, and since it's square, you're going to get a, free, a, uh, a harmonic at, at 21, and another one at 14 to that, and so on and go on up. Obviously, those are very easy to filter out. And so you can create this and come out of it with a square wave. And that is how our digital radios work. They're not doing anything resonant in there except in that little crystal where they've got that little oscillator going. And that's it. And even that they're just using to create a square wave. Now, um, so we've got this digital radio here. It's got very broad band amplifiers. It's amplifying with components that weren't even thought of 50 years ago. That, you know, when they first came out with transistors, they used to think, oh, well, they're just like tubes. Well, they aren't. They're very, very, very different. But it took them a while to figure that out. And uh, transistors are current devices. It's usually easiest to work with current. Uh, tubes are voltage devices, so you work with transconductance and things like that. Uh, which are, um, uh, you know, the opposite of uh, just resistance and so on. And uh, so they're very different. So tube circuits tend, tend to be entirely resonant-based, whereas your transistor radio, transistor-based radio, um, if it's a super hat, it's working on resonant principles. If it's like the ICOM, the reference station here, everything is digital. Everything is digital, and you finally get down to that last amplifier, then you throw that filter in to get rid of the harmonics, and out comes a beautiful sine wave. Very nice stuff like that. There's a lot of nuance to it, but the point is that it's broadband, not resonant. If it's resonant, it's not broadband, it's high Q. You've got to tune. And when you tune on a super heterodyne with one knob, if you've ever looked under the covers, you've got a whole string of variable capacitors on that one shaft. And each one of those variable capacitors is associated with a different stage or with a local oscillator in order to make that thing all work together. The guy who first put this together was Major... Um, Armstrong, not Louis Armstrong, uh, 
Um, I'll think of his name in a while, or one of you will and put it in the comments. He was a military guy, uh, Army Signal Corps. He invented uh, both uh, regenerative receivers, uh, superheterodyne uh, receivers, transmitters, and uh, FM radio. And he got almost no monetary rewards for that. It was an absolute cutthroat industry back then, terribly cutthroat. And he um, wasn't a businessman. He was an engineer. He wasn't a businessman. So he didn't get uh, very much out of it. Now, this brings us to antennas. Antennas resonate. Okay. They resonate. Now, they're usually somewhat low-Q devices. They might resonate over a whole band or something like that. And in order to match that to the radio, you've got to have some mechanism that will make sure that the impedance... Remember, the impedance... The word sounds fancy. It's just the ratio of the voltage to the current in the device. The ratio of the voltage to the current. So if you have an antenna that's 30 ohms because it's a dipole real close to the ground, that means the ratio of the voltage to the current at the feed point is 30. 30 volts for every amp. Okay, so 30 ohms. And um, then you've got this transmission line. Now, the thing about these is we have yet to invent very many non-resonant digital type antennas. Now, there are some antennas that have extremely broad Q, very low Q antennas, like... Um, Oh, let's see. There's the uh, one that's got this a disc cone. It's got a circle at the top and has, uh, you know, coming down like this, wires and so on. And this is, it is a resonant antenna, but it's extremely low Q. And because of that, you can use one for the entire HF band. There are log periodic antennas where the spacing, see the, how the spacing is getting closer at the same time this is coming down, and they're not one driven element, all the elements are driven, and they're driven backwards from each other. Um, and these log periodic antennas are directional somewhat, about 10 dB gain, extremely expensive and used by like the FAA, who needs to communicate via HF with airplanes that are over the ocean, that don't have satellite. Okay, and they can use these to do HF communications with the airliners and whatnot, and do air traffic control and handle emergencies and so on. But by and large, the antennas that HAMS use, here's a dipole, okay, and you got the ends up here, and you got the ends up here, and you've got your cable coming down here. Okay, this is a resonant antenna. That means that in some sense, the impedance right here, the R approaches some value. Okay, and this is the resistance. This is the DC, not DC. Not DC, I'm sorry, the AC resistance. And the X or reactive component, we want to be somewhere around zero. If we have this, we have what's called a resonant antenna. Now, it's almost impossible to make it perfectly resonant. First of all, dipoles misbehave. And a real dipole, a, a half-wave dipole, um, will take one at a reasonable height, 30 feet, 40 feet for like a 40 meter dipole. And what we're going to find out is the R is say somewhere between uh, 30 and uh, 60, okay, and the X is 
if it's a, actually a resonant half wave, is going to be about uh, J35 ohms, which means there's reactants in it. Okay. And this is what you run into when you run into resonance or trying to get something resonant or anything like that, is that there's going to be reactive components. You can model any component like an antenna as a resistor and we'll call this the radiation resistance okay radiation resistance is there's going to be uh, heat well not heat it's going to be come out in electromagnetic form uh, this is the part that's radiated the power is radiated from this you will have some other resistance that's R that is ohmic resistance. Then you will have some capacitance and you will have some inductance. And this is what the feed line sees. Two kinds of resistance. We want the ohmic resistance to be as low as possible. There's some capacitance in there and there's some inductance. And remember that X for um, inductance is a positive uh, value and x for capacitance is a negative value and these two cancel each other and the way you tune an antenna is by getting these two to cancel each other but then you still have the problem of the sum of these two resistances which may not be 50 ohms and your radio being a transistor device and working with current really 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 wants to see a resistive load a purely resistive load forget the capacitance forget the inductance it wants to see those two cancel it just wants a resistive load furthermore there is a theorem that if you have something that has a resistance looking this way of R1 going and attached to something with the resistance looking this way of R2 you get the biggest power transfer when R1 equals R2 okay otherwise what happens is this thing cannot absorb the power sent the wrong way with the wrong impedance so it will send some power back this creates a standing wave okay or what we like to call a standing wave so let's look at transmission lines I'll use just uh, coax okay there's coax you've got a wire next uh, next to a tube okay what's that it's a capacitor right you've got a long wire going this way and what do you get out of a long wire inductance so you've got inductance and capacitance and you can figure out the inductance and the capacitance per um, I'll put meter down here per unit length okay now ideally you'd like these to cancel each other and then there is resistance okay now there is a formula that you plug this into to find the so-called characteristic impedance of the coax now what the characteristic impedance of a transmission line is that um, it's the ratio it's like any impedance it's the ratio of the voltage to the current and you put something through a transmission line this is where transmission line theory and antenna theory differ from circuit theory circuit theory you're used to lumped components like that's a resistor that's a capacitor and so on in transmission line theory you're now getting into the theory of fields and waves and and the impedance is the natural ratio of voltage to current in the medium okay 
you're saying, well then, good grief, how about in, in thin air? There's voltage and currents uh, in the fields, electromagnetic fields, and uh, is there a um, impedance there? Yeah, there is, it's 377 ohms. Free space, slightly different in the atmosphere, but free space, about 377 ohms. Now think of this, think of this. You got a 50 ohm transmitter, you got free space that's 377 ohms ohms. It is the job of the antenna to do the impedance matching between the 50 ohms of the transmitter and the 377 ohms of free space. So an antenna is, in a very real sense, very real sense, a transformer. Okay. But now let's look how this works. A transmission line of length L, where L is not equal to lambda over 2 uh, O times uh, 2N, where N is an integer. Uh, so lambda over 2, 3 halves, 5 halves, and so on. Okay, um, if it is equal to this, if this is exactly a uh, multiple of, well, I think that's just one end because a, a, a full wavelength will do the same thing. If it is not, if it is a multiple of a half wavelength, then the impedance at this end, oh, well, let's not use L, let's do, oh, can't do left and right because that's an L. If this is a half wavelength electrically taking into account the speed of transmission in coax then this impedance equals this impedance but only if it is lambda over 2 some multiple of that okay only if you shift your frequency by 1 hertz it's no longer true Okay, the further away you get from it, the further uh, bad it is. Now, there are a couple things we know about transmission lines. In general, unless you did what I showed you there, the impedance looking in, in, I N, and the impedance looking back, um, yeah, looking back that way, X out, X in is not equal to X out. A feed line will change the impedance. So if you've got an antenna here, now there is, there's one other exception to that. And that is if the load here is equal to the characteristic impedance of that then it will not matter what the length is and the characteristic impedance of the antenna matches the characteristic impedance of the transmission line will equal this impedance here will equal this impedance here okay but in most cases your antenna is not perfectly it's got a resistance uh, plus j uh, times the whatever the, the reactance is, okay, plus or minus, plus or minus, okay, and there will be a transformation of that by the transmission line so that what comes out over here is a different R, I'll call it R prime plus J X prime, it's different. This is what is presented to the radio. If this is not 50 ohms and you have a 50 ohm radio, then whatever this is won't matter so much because the transmission line is going to change it and that will be presented to the radio. Now the problem is, of course, the radio is 50 ohms. Now it used to be in old tube type amplifiers. They used something called a Pi network. 
it looked like this. It was a coil. And this came off usually of the last, the plate. Uh, there was a capacitor here. Okay, and an RFC to B+. Plus. Um, but there was, this is the output here. Now, uh, like I said, um, tubes are very high impedance devices. So there would be a capacitor here that was variable, and this was called the plate capacitor. And there was a capacitor here that was variable, and this was called the load capacitor. And usually, this was fixed, okay? And so, on old radios, you tune them with plate load, and it matches this high impedance to whatever this impedance is over here, okay? That's why you didn't see much about tuners in the, in the old radio era. Uh, the, the final output tuning was, in fact, uh, an a, uh, uh, antenna tuner. So what are we trying to do? What is the tuner tuning? We're going to put a tuner right here, and it's a 50-ohm radio. Okay, so the radio, when you look at the radio, it's 50 ohms. If you look into this, the tuner, it's 50 ohms. If over here you have an antenna that has an impedance of R plus JX coming through here, this is going to be changed to R prime plus JX prime. And the impedance going this way are you ready for this? You ready for this? R prime minus J X prime. This is called the complex conjugate. So if the antenna is inductive, you hit it back with something capacitive and between the inductance and capacitance, the cancel, you get just the R, and there's something magical in this circuit that if this is 50 ohms and this is 30 ohms for your R, it'll match. Now, all that seems terribly complex. The question is, what's inside a tuner? Almost all tuners that you see on the market today have this same circuit. It's called a T. It comes in, there is a capacitor that is variable. Another capacitor that is variable and a coil to ground and of course the other attaches here and that goes out to there. And that's it, that's it, that is all there is in a tuner. Now note in the tuner, oh by the way this is variable too. This is so unlike the Pi network, this by the way is electrically equivalent to the Pi network except that we're making the coil variable too. Now on some exotic tuners, the bigger tuners, you actually have the coil as a big thing and you turn it and this little wheel across the top moves across to tap it at the right place. These capacitors here, um, one will be labeled a transmitter and they'll be labeled load or something. Sometimes they aren't even labeled. Okay, now um, it's possible if you want to be cheap, and a lot of people are, to eliminate that capacitor but if it turns out this won't do it, you flip it around so you move the capacitor over there. Okay? Now, in automatic tuners, what you have are a whole bunch of relays and a whole bunch of little capacitors, and it pulls those in and out, in and out, in and out, and so on. And the same with the coil.
This doesn't look like a transformer, but it is. Because this right here can have 50 ohms looking back, 50 ohms pure resistive, the right frequency. And then what goes out over here is R prime minus J X prime, okay? That is an X. Not what I made that out to be. X prime with a J in front of it. Okay, now you have to adjust these in whatever order, if it's manual, to get what you want. And you can have reactive stuff here, reactive stuff here, and have it look purely resistive here. Okay, what are you tuning? when you do this. You are adjusting this so that it'll take 50 ohms and add inductance or subtract inductance and actually, believe it or not, change the value of R. That's a pretty wild thing. And it's all done without any resistive components. Why no resistive components? Because you don't want to lose power in them. Where is the transformer? Well, you don't need a transformer because a transformer changes impedance. And this will change impedance not only in the resistive sense, but in the reactive sense as well. So what does a tuner tune? I'm sorry to take so doggone long to get around to Dave's question. A tuner tunes the combination of the transmission line and the antenna and its environment such that it looks to the transmitter or amplifier as 50 ohms resistive. That's what a tuner does. That's all a tuner does. Now, anytime you change frequency, those numbers start to go out the window. And you may have noticed, if you've got your automatic tuner on, if you move very far on a band, you'll hear it go clickety-clickety-clickety-clack as it seeks a new uh, tuning solution. Now, speaking of the word solution, okay, if you've got an antenna and a feed line, okay, you can measure. With, you can measure the resistance and the reactance that's this way and run it through a little microprocessor to calculate the value that the various capacitors and inductor needs to be in the tuner and put it right there. And that's what tuners like the MFJ993B do. They calculate it first so that they can get close to it and then they tweak it until they get it just final. Now I've noticed that like for example the uh, 993B, um, if it's close I might hit the little button that says add a little capacitance and give the next little tweak capacitance and I might get closer to a perfect tune. Okay, The tune, what you are told about the tune is the SWR. Usually there's an SWR meter between the transmitter and the uh, radio so that you can see uh, how well you've been. You want that SWR to be low, okay? Now, of course, a low SWR, it might be a little bit higher if it's actually truly resonant. If you just kick in a little inductance or a little capacitance in there, you can bring the SWR down a little bit. It's kind of funny how that works, but it does work that way. What you're interested in is the SWR because that's the back power that is going to come back into your uh, transceiver and heat up the finals, and you don't want that to happen. Now, all modern, not the earliest all transistor radios, but the modern ones have got protective circuits so that if you don't get there fast enough, it'll uh, cut it back for you.
some of the early uh, Kenwoods and so on that were all transistor, you had to be extremely careful about the tuning before you applied full power. So there you go. There is another little rather lengthy, overly lengthy, obviously overly lengthy uh, Ask Dave video about what am I tuning when I use a tuner. Simple answer is you're tuning the combination of the feed line, the antenna, and the environment, okay, to make your little radio happy. And we want our radios to be happy. So there you have it. And I appreciate your time today. If you would like to uh, contribute financially to this channel, you certainly can. Go to decastlercom slash um, support. Um, I'm pleased to report that I hope within the next week or two to announce an arrangement with the ARRL that is, yeah, got me a little scared because it's going to be a little bit of responsibility, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. So until we next meet, 73.